Marcus Tullius Cicer. In defense of Sextus Roscius of Ameria. Translated by Michael Grant. Read by Max Latham. Speech delivered in 80 before the Christian era. You must find it very surprising, judges, to see all these noble orators and eminent citizens firmly rooted in their seats, whereas I, on the other hand, am standing up here and addressing you. For, after all, I cannot compare with these seated personages in age, and still less in influence. It is true enough that every one of them, every single man you see here today, is utterly convinced that the charge on which this case is based is an unjust one, which it is imperative to refute. A charge which only an unprecedented act of criminality could ever have concocted. Nevertheless, they do not actually venture to undertake the refutation themselves, owing to the hazardous times in which we live. They are here, that is to say, because they consider it their duty to be here. But they want to stay out of danger, and that is why they are keeping quiet. Do I imply by these words that I am a braver person than they are? Far from it. Or do I mean that I am more conscientious? No, I certainly don't covet that sort of praise, if it means diverting it from someone else. You may well ask, then, my real motive in undertaking this defence of Sextus Roscius, which in others was, the others were so reluctant to touch. Well, my motive was this. These men I am speaking of are important, authoritative figures, now, if any of them had made a statement, and if anything in this statement had possessed political implications, a thing which would have been inevitable in a case like the present one, then people would have made out that he was meaning a great deal more than he had actually intended to. But I, on the contrary, can say every single thing that needs to be said, and say it with the most complete freedom, without there being the slightest question of my speech becoming known or achieving publicly to anything like the same degree. For the others are men of rank and position, and nothing they say can pass unnoticed. Besides, they are of such ripe age and experience that no allowances will be made for the smallest indiscretion they may commit. But my case is quite different. If I speak out of turn, either nobody will ever hear of it, because I am someone who has not even started his career, or, if they do hear of it, they will pardon the lapse upon the grounds of my youthful years though the term pardon has lost its real meaning these days, when the custom of holding judicial inquiries, to which the word ought to exclusively to apply, has virtually been swept out of existence. And another reason why I accept the commission is this. For all I know, the circumstances in which the others were requested to take on Sextus Roscius's case may have been such that they felt at liberty either to accept or to refuse such pleas without violating any obligation. But as the approach to myself came from men whose friendship I regard as carrying enormous weight, I cannot forget all the services I have received from them, not to speak of the high positions they occupy in the Roman imperial state, the kindness they have done to me, as well as the importance of their rank, seemed to me too great a disregard, and so I felt that I could not possibly ignore their wishes. There are the reasons why I agreed to undertake Roscius's defence. It is not a question of having been singled out as the most talented pleader. No, the point was that I was the person left over, the person who could plead with the least danger. To say that I was chosen in order to guarantee that Sextus Roscius should have been, had the best possible defence would not be the truth. I was chosen in order to ensure that he had any defence at all. You may well feel inclined to ask for further information about this fear and terror which induces all those distinguished figures to abandon their usual code of behaviour to such an extent that they actually decline to defend a man whose life and property are at stake. And yet, if this puzzles you, I am hardly surprised, since the prosecutors have deliberately failed to mention the real motive which lies behind the accusation they are bringing forward. Well, what is the motive? It is this. The father of my client, Sextus Roscius, possessed property worth six million stesterci. But a certain young man claims that he has bought it, and that he has to admit that the sum he paid was for only two thousand stesterci. 
The young man is Lucius Cornelius Chrysogonus, whose position in our country today is exceptionally powerful. And the alleged seller was a valiant and glorious Lucius Sulla, whose name, of course, I mention with all due respect. What Chrysogonus seems to be asking you, judges, is this. Quite unlawfully, he says, he has seized an extensive and magnificent estate, which is not his at all, but belongs to someone else. And since this is so, and since the life of my client, Sextus Roscius, may be regarded in, as an obstacle standing in the way of his enjoyment of that estate, it is up to you, O oh judges, to take steps to eliminate the worries and anxieties that this situation causes him. For while Sextus Roscius remains at large, Chrysogonus feels serious doubts of whether he can contrive that this ample and wealthy patrimony belonging to a wholly blameless individual shall remain in his own greedy clutches. But if Roscius can only be convicted and thus forced to depart from the scene, Chrysogonus looks forward to the prospect of being able to retain the proceeds of his crime, to squander and dissipate and extravagantly as he pleases. This, then, is the anxious longing which nags and torments him day and night. What he is doing, therefore, is to entreat you to set his mind at rest by pronouncing yourselves his accomplices in these ill-gotten gains. Well, if that seems fair to you, an honourable demand, gentlemen, then please allow me, without taking up too much of your time, put forward a counter-request which seems to me to be a good bit fairer. First of all, I request Chrysogonus to make one concession. Let him be content with the whole of our property, with all that we possess. He must not demand our lifeblood as well. And of you, judges, too, I have a certain request to make. I ask you to resist the evil deeds of evil men and to believe the distress of the innocent and I beg you to save us all from a terrible peril, because the peril to which Sextus Roscius is exposed in this trial is one which casts its menace over the entire community. If inquiry brings to light even the slightest corroboration of the charge, even the smallest suspicion of my client's guilt, if it reveals even the most minute trace of any point that could make the accusation look justified, if you could detect it in the prosecution's case, even the faintest sign of a motive whatsoever other than a simple desire to acquire loot, then by all means, let Sextus Roscius's life be sacrificed to the malignant pleasures of these individuals, and I have no objection to raise. But, if the one and only issue is to satisfy the lust for gain in creatures who are incapable of ever being satisfied, if the entire object they have in mind is that the rich and massive plunder that they have laid their hands on shall be topped up and crowned by the conviction of Sextus Roscius, then surely, out of a great many deplorable acts of the situation, the most infamous of all is this, the fact that you yourselves, whose legal verdicts are given in oath, should now seem in their eyes to be suitable instruments to achieve the purposes they had formerly employed, methods of brutal violence to attain. After all, gentlemen, the reason why you were elected from the citizen body to be members of the Senate is because of the noble qualities of your personal characters. Then you were called from the Senate to become members of this court, and that was because of your inflexible incorruptibility. How on earth, then, can you be the right people for this set of assassins and gladiators to think that they can impose their demands upon? And what they are demanding is not just exemption from the punishment which their iniquities give them every reason to fear and dread at your hands. They are actually claiming permission to leave this court, still enriched and loaded with the spoils they have seized without a shred of legality. The crimes they have committed are wicked and horrible. Nothing I could say could ever be bad enough to describe them. No words that I could find to utter would do justice to this appalling character these deeds. No superlatives would be sufficient to brand them with the condemnation they demand. To assail such actions as they deserve would exceed my powers. The necessary gravity would be beyond my years, and the necessary outspokenness is discouraged by our times. Moreover, I have special, personal reasons for feeling nervous. For one thing, I am retiring by nature. 
and then you are important people, and my opponents are formidable, and the fate that threatens Sextus Roscius cannot fail to inspire terror. For all of these reasons, O oh judges, I particularly implore you to listen to what I shall have to say, not only with great care, but with indulgent sympathy. I know I have undertaken a burden in excess of my capacities, but my reason for doing so is because I have such a complete and limitless trust in your integrity and understanding. If you will lighten the burden in some degree, then I, for my part, will endure it as well as I can, with all the diligence and determination I am able to muster. And indeed, even if you desert me, though this is a fate I cannot bring myself to think about, even then I shall not lose heart. I have taken the job on, and I propose to carry it through to the very best of my ability. If it proves to be beyond me, I would rather be crushed by the weight of the duty I am trying to perform than be accused of disloyalty or irresolution for shirking the task which my friends have entrusted to me. And I most solemnly urge you, Marcus Fannius, to prove to us and to your country today that you are the same man whom the Roman people admired once before when you were presiding over this court. Take a look at the enormous crowd that has come to listen to this trial. You can see very well their air of eager expectancy, their earnest desire that the proceedings should be just and impartial. It's unmistakable. This is the first murder case that has been heard for a very long time, although in the meantime there has been no lack of abominable murders. But now that you have become praetor, everybody fervently hopes that this court over which you are presiding will really rise to the responsibility of dealing appropriately with the frightful bloody crimes that recur again and again every single day. In most trials, it is the accusers who offer up vigorous appeals for severity. Today, it is we, the accused, who make the appeal. We appeal to you, Fannings, and to your fellow judges to punish criminal acts with unswerving determination. We entreat you to be adamant in your resistance to malefactors, and we urge you to take careful note of one point. If you fail to take advantage of this opportunity to make your policy abundantly clear, then we have indeed, beyond any shadow of a doubt, reached a point when all the limits set down to human greed and malpractice and outrage have broken down completely. From this time onwards, if you fail to do your duty, the slaughter will no longer be in secret. No, henceforth it will take place here in the very forum itself. Here, Fannius, in front of your own platform. Judges, the massacre from now on will be committed right here in front of your faces, sitting right here among the benches where you are. For quite obviously that is the reason why this charge has been brought, to clear the way for anarchy of such a kind, total anarchy, unrestricted anarchy. One... On the one hand, you have prosecutors who have seized my client's property. On the other hand, you have my client, whom they have left with no possessions in the world except utter ruin. The people who gained by the murder of Sextus Roscius are the men who are bringing forward the charges today. To my client, on the other hand, his father's death has given him nothing but grief and destitution. Yet, even so, his enemies have displayed the most horrifying determination to finish him off by putting him to death as well. That is why, even when he appears before this court, he has to be accompanied by an escort. Otherwise, he would be killed on this very spot before your own eyes. And so, these are the people who punish Rome, prosecutors in this case. As for the defendant, he has escaped so far the dreadful massacre by the, which they conducted, and he is the only man who has succeeded in escaping. But no description of mine, gentlemen, can begin to deal adequately with all the horrors of which they are guilty, and this is something I want you to fully understand. I propose, therefore, to set before you the whole story of what happened from the very beginning. Then you will have a better appreciation of all the misfortunes that have fallen upon my blameless and innocent client. You will also be in a position to realize the full gravity of the crimes committed by his opponents, and you will see at the same time the truly lamentable condition of our country. My client's father, named Sextus Roscius, 
just like his son, was a citizen of Ameria. By birth and rank and wealth alike, he was easily the most prominent man, not only of his own town, but in the entire neighbourhood. He also enjoyed extensive goodwill among the greatest people of Rome, and was connected to them by close relations of hospitality. He possessed links of this kind to the Caecili Metelli, and the Serquili, and the Cornelli Scipiones. These are the houses which I name, as I should with a keen sense of their splendid character and reputation. And Sextus Roscius knew the members of these families personally, and enjoyed intimate relations with them. Well, out of all his many assets, this was the one he managed to leave his son. The only one. His inheritance. He failed to bequeath since robbers in the heart of his own family used violent means to seize it for themselves. And so now the former hosts and friends of Cluentius' father are compelled to come to the defence of his innocent son in order to protect his honour and his life. The father had always favoured the cause of the nobility during the recent civil war. During the crisis, when the entire position and safety of every noble was threatened, he was conspicuous throughout his home country for the energy, enthusiasm and influence he had exerted in defence of the aristocrats and their cause. It was to them he owed his exceptionally honourable position among his own people. When, therefore, their honour was at stake, he felt it only right to come to their aid. Then victory was won, and we laid down our arms. Yet it was a time of prescription. Some people suspected of having favoured the opposite side were being arrested upon all sides. But Sextus Roscius, the father of my client, appeared constantly at Rome. Every day he went to the Forum, for all to see. Here was a man, one would say, who was manifestly rejoicing in the victory of the aristocratic party. The very last thing he ever expected was that this victory would actually bring about his own destruction. However, he had long standing feuds with two other men, also called Roscius, from his own town of Ameria. One of them I see here today, sitting among the accusers. As for the other, I am told that he has taken possession of the three farms that are the rightful property of my client. Sextus Roscius the Elder was always worried about this feud, and if his precautions had been as great as his anxieties, he would still be alive today. For his fears, gentlemen, were all too amply justified. I must tell you something about these two enemies of his. Both are called Titus Roscius. The one who has the farms bears the surname Capito, and the other, the one who is here today, is called Magnus. Capito may be described as an old, experienced gladiator who has won many victories to his credit. Magnus has recently gone into training as his pupil. Before the present contest, as far as I am aware, he was no more than a novice. But now his violent and outrageous behaviour has gone far beyond anything that even his trainer himself could achieve. One evening, my client's father was returning from a dinner party. When he had reached the neighbourhood of the Bars of Palakina, he was struck down and assassinated. His son at the time was at Temeria, but Magnus was in Rome. The dead man's son used to spend all his time on his farms. In accordance with his father's wishes, he devoted himself to the management of his estate and to the various activities of country life. Magnus, on the other hand, was constantly at Rome. I hope that this very circumstance already makes it perfectly clear that he, rather than Cluentius, is the man who ought to be suspected of the crime. Indeed, I feel perfectly confident in adding a further point as well. If the other facts of the case which you are now going to hear fall short, even in the very slightest degree, of transforming the suspicion into a certainty, you are at full liberty, as far as I am concerned, to go ahead and declare that my client was involved in the murder after all. After Sextus Roscius the Elder had been killed, the first man to bring the news to Ameria was a certain Malius Glaucia, an ex-slave with no visible means of support, a dependent, a friend of Titus Magnus. However, Glaucia did not select the bereaved son as the recipient of his information, but imparted it instead to the person who hated the dead man the most, namely Capita. The murder had only been committed one hour after nightfall. Yet here was the messenger, already at Ameria, by the first rays of dawn, during the ten hours of the night, he had taken relays of light carriages and had sped over a distance of no less than fifty-six miles. 
nor was he merely content to be the first to bring the longed-for tidings to the murdered man's enemy. He was also determined actually to show Capito the freshly shed blood of the person he so detested and the weapon that had only just recently been pulled out of the victim's body. Four days after these happenings, news of the deed was reported to Chrysogonus in Sulla's camp at Voltaire. He was also informed of the great extent of Sextus Roscius' property and the excellent quality of his farms. For Roscius left thirteen farms, nearly all adjacent to the Tiber. My client's helplessness and isolation were also dwelt upon, and it was pointed out that since his father, a distinguished and popular figure, had been killed without the smallest difficulty, it would be surely the easiest thing in the world to dispose of the son, who was merely an unsuspecting countryman, quite unknown at Rome. So Magnus and Capito promised their help in getting the younger Roscius out of the way as well. In short, judges, a partnership in crime was established. This was a time when there was no longer any talk of prescriptions, and when people even who had previously lived in fear of such a fate were making their way back to their homes under the impression that the peril was over. Nevertheless, it was now that the name of Sextus Roscius the father in spite of all the ardent support he had given to the victorious cause of the nobility, was inserted into the list of this prescribed people. His possessions, in consequence, were sold, and Chrysogonus bought them. Three of the farms, among the best of the whole lot, were handed over to Capito and his own property, and he is occupying them today. The remaining portion of the estate was seized by Magnus in the name of Chrysogonus. Magnus would tell you so himself. The value of this land was six million sesterci, but it was bought... More than, no more than 2,000. Now, I am perfectly sure, gentlemen, that Lucius Sula knew nothing about any of this. He is kept fully occupied on our national affairs, repairing the past and at the same time anticipating the probable demands of the future, the arrangements by which peace has to be established, the powers needed to wage war, these are the matters to which he devotes himself and over which he exercises sole control. All eyes are turned towards him. It is he who directs everything. Matters of the utmost importance engross his continual attention, so that he scarcely has time even to breathe. In these circumstances, it is surely not very surprising if, from time to time, there is something or other that escapes Sulla's notice. After all, think of the host of people who spend their time watching until he is fully engaged elsewhere, so that the very first moment his back is turned, they can concoct some sort of plan of precisely the kind we are concerned with here. And there is another point as well. We know that he is Sulla the fe fortunate Felix, but nobody can be so thoroughly well endowed by good fortune that his large household does not include a single slave or former slave who may be dishonest. Meanwhile, this splendid Magnus, this agent of Chrysogonus, arrives in Ameria, sees holes of my client's farms. He finds the poor Roscius overwhelmed with grief because of his bereavement, and before he has even time to complete his father's funeral, Magnus has expelled him naked from his own house, driven him headlong from his ancestral hearth and home and household gods, and that is how Magnus himself became the owner of these extensive estates. Hitherto being limited to his own slender means, he had lived very poorly, but now, after he had succeeded in grabbing what did not belong to him, he cast all restraint aside, as happens so often in such cases. He carried away a great deal to his own home, Quite openly and secretly he removed even more. He lavished large and extravagant presents upon his accomplices, and what was left over he sold at auction. This was regarded by the people of Ameria as such a scandalous proceeding that there was weeping and lamentation all over the town. Simultaneously, a whole series of tragic events crowded in upon their gaze. They saw their prosperous fellow citizen, the elder Sextus Roscius, brutally murdered. They saw his son reduced to shameful destitution. Out of all his large inheritance, that infamous robber had not even left him the right of way to his own father's tomb. And they saw the outrageous purchase and occupation by someone else of the property that ought to have been his. It was, indeed, a tale of theft and plunder, and of henchmen well rewarded. Now the whole population of Ameria would have stopped at nothing to prevent Magnus from gloating and lording it over the property of that good and respected man, Sextus Roscius. And so the local town council, as soon as it possibly could, passed a decree that its 
pronounced instructions that ten principal members should go to see Lucius Sula personally. They were to tell him what sort of man Sextus Roscius had been. There was a large complaint about the iniquitous behaviour of his enemies, and they were to implore him to consent not only to the rehabilitation of the dead father's good name, but also to the restoration of his possessions to his innocent son. I will now read you the terms of the decree. <laughs> 